This video was brought to you by my loyal patrons. Pledge today and receive exclusive perks. Link in the description. Dear Christopher, Here is your friend Thomas the Tank Engine. He wanted to come out of his station yard and see the world. These stories tell you how he did it. Oh boy, here we are, folks. After seven seasons, a movie, and a spin-off series, we've finally reached it. The hit entertainment era of Thomas and Friends. Season 8. The season where everything changed twofold. Now a lot of people say that season 8 is the good season of the hit era, so I'm interested in seeing exactly what it offers. It's been a long time since I've watched this season in full, so this should be interesting. So, let's dive in. Following Hit Entertainment's purchase of Ghislaine in 2002, they plan to reinvent Thomas in their image. Their plans for the series would officially roll out in 2004, with the release of Season 8. Season 8 is what I can only describe as a soft reboot. It's almost like starting from scratch again, but also not totally ignoring all past events and canon. This soft reboot would focus on making the show more overtly educational, with more simplified vocabulary and very clear morals for a much more targeted younger audience, rather than the more general kid audience that the previous seasons were. The entire format of the show was changed, lengthening the previous four and a half minute episode runtime to seven minutes, and greeting the show with a new theme song called The Engine Roll Call, composed by Ed Welch. The classic Cynthia Thomas theme song by Mike O'Donnell and Junior Campbell was no more, and Welch's roll call was in. A new score composer was also brought on, Robert Hartshorn, fully taking the torch from veterans O'Donnell and Campbell. O'Donnell and Campbell weren't the only Thomas alumni to take their leave this year. Following creative differences with the hit team, director David Bitten stepped away as well, being superseded by his longtime assistant director, Steve Asquith, who would stay on as the show's main director until the end of the model era. This soft reboot saw the cast streamlined to focus solely on eight primary characters to re-establish them to audiences. This new core cast of characters, Thomas, Percy, James, Gordon, Henry, Edward, Emily, and Toby, were dubbed the Steam Team, with their home base being Tidmouth Sheds. Much of the already supporting cast was tossed aside, with the only secondary characters that appear being the usual staples, namely Diesel, Birdie the Bus, Harold the Helicopter, Trevor, Cranky, etc., and a selection of newer characters introduced in seasons 6 and 7. Other than them, no one else really appears. Even the narrow gauge engines were sidelined this year for the Steam Team to be the focus. In attempt to add some more female diversity to the main cast, Emily, who was introduced in Season 7, was now pulled in as a main character, and so was given quite a few leading roles this season. Prior to Season 8's production, head writer Abby Grant was tasked with reworking a writer's guide for the series outlining all the characters, locations, style of writing, etc. for new writers to the series, to make sure consistency was kept. This document was titled, The Thomas and Friends Writer's Bible, and was created in 2003. As useful as a tool as this guide was, it unfortunately stated many bizarre inconsistencies. This would be the source of most of the inconsistencies and weird decisions in the show and characters moving forward. Things like Henry being said to be a hypochondriac that needs special coal, and Sir Handel being a very friendly engine that gives 110%. There are some interesting pieces of lore in this document, like how it mentions Boko and Stepney of all characters, but the main thing to take away is that this is what all the writers for the show moving forward would be using as reference. There are some sections of this guide that give us a very clear understanding of the direction Hit wanted to take Thomas. This section on the engine's drivers, for example, says this. 
The status of the drivers or firemen has changed from that in Series 1-7. to Previously, the drivers had to be mentioned when describing actions or movements that the engines made. For instance, engines could not just slow down or go faster. Their volition had to be filtered through the driver, i.e. the driver applied the brakes. But this has all changed. Now you don't need to mention drivers and firemen, unless their presence is material to the story. Allowing the engines a greater degree of volition means many more story choices can be made. Now the engines can just do whatever they want, or go wherever they want if a story needs them to. I also want to highlight this bit in the writing style guide, where it goes over age-appropriate language. Big words are encouraged to be avoided, and harsh vocabulary replaced with gentler terms. For instance, we never say frightened, terrified, or horrified. We say scared. Characters never hate or detest things. They don't like things. The writers are encouraged to play down to the kids now, and keep all the dialogue simple, which is something the Reverend W. Audrey himself personally disapproved of. I'm not going to go through this whole document, but I have linked it in the description for you to read through on your own time. The key thing to take away here is that Hit wanted to essentially dumb down Thomas for a much more targeted younger audience, and this writer's bible is proof of that. The more technical side of things saw some major changes too. The 35mm film cameras used throughout seasons 1 through 7 were replaced with Sony digital camera equipment, making this the first season filmed in all digital, and all in 50 frames per second instead of the previous 25 frames per second. And boy oh boy is it noticeable. For tracking and POV shots, they started using what I can only describe as a GoPro camera. The quality totally changes in these shots. They must have not liked how these looked, because they would use whatever camera this was for these shots very sparingly in the following seasons. Another new addition to the series with this season were a series of learning segments. Small educational bumpers that would appear between episodes on home media or when they aired on TV in half hour blocks. But as these are separate from the episodes themselves, I'm not really going to talk much about them, as this video is on the season not the supplementary material. It's the same reason I haven't talked about any of the music videos for the previous seasons. But these bumpers are a good example of how things started getting watered down this year. With all this change, there was at least one constant that carried over, and that was the narrators. In the UK, longtime narrator Michael Angelus returned and continued on business as usual. Michael Brandon, who had just taken on the role of the US narrator, returned as well. And because of Season 7's weird distribution over here in the States, Season 8 was a lot of people's first time hearing his voice. That is a lot of change that occurred in a very short amount of time. In the span of a year, Thomas now had new owners, a new format, new episode length, a new theme song, a new score, new digital cameras, and a new primary cast with a large chunk of the already established supporting cast gone. Needless to say, Season 8 did not go over that well with longtime fans when it first released, and it has been the subject of criticism from fans for years. It is nearly 20 years old now though, wow time flies, and a lot of people have reconsidered this season to be the good one of the hit era. Now it's been a long time since I've watched the season in full, so now with all this out of the way, Let's see just what Season 8 has to offer. I think a lot of you watching are expecting me to tear Season 8 a new one. I mean, I came out of Season 6 not really liking it as much as I used to. Surely, I'm going to dislike Season 8. And well, you're not totally wrong to think that. However, I don't want this to be a hate fest, and I think it's important to talk about all of the season's aspects, good and bad. So let's start with all the good. First off, Steve Asquith is now firmly the main director of the show, and right away it's easy to tell the direction style is notably different than Mittens. Asquith loves zoom ins and zoom outs on characters' faces and panning across the sets and establishing shots. There's clearly a heavier focus on camera movement. I really like this, it adds a lot of life to the visual style. I don't think Asquith was a bad director by any means. He had consistently worked on Thomas since season 1, 
and he knew how to film with models pretty well by this point. Speaking of models, the model work is just as good as it always is. There's plenty of impressive sequences this season, like the storm scene in Emily's Adventure when roofs are ripped off buildings, the haunting, foggy look of the scrapyard in Halloween, and many of the crashes in general. Also, this moment when Henry rams the buffet car. <laughs> the comedic timing of this scene is hilarious. The fact it's all miniatures is what makes it work. I think it was the model work alone that kept me watching the show in spite of all the changes. Practical models doing anything on camera, regardless of context, will always be charming and impressive to watch. Though I have to say, I am starting to feel the sets are all becoming kind of samey. We don't really deviate that far from green countryside much this year, and all the open line sets are pretty consistently just three straight tracks. A little more variety would be appreciated. Those mountainy picturesque backdrops that mysteriously disappeared in Season 7 are also sorely missed here, and as a result, sometimes sets feel rather small without that implied distance. The new higher frame rate doesn't exactly help sell the illusion either. The smoother footage makes these trains look even more like models. Another notable change this season, and a very positive one at that, is the inclusion of more diverse human props. Prior, most humans we saw were all Caucasian skinned, but with this season onwards, now we see humans with all sorts of skin colors. It's a small but nice way for the show to be a bit more inclusive. Speaking of the humans, you can tell they really enjoyed sprinkling in bits of humor when the humans got focus. Things like Sir Topham Hatt showing up to the sheds in the middle of the night in his pajamas, Farmer McColl's house being filled with sheep, or the poor teacher scared for his life when chickens take over the school. The human's presence as active participating characters and stories starts to dwindle with this season. The days where Sir Topham Hatt would get an episode to himself are long behind us, but they are still very much around and well-loved, at least by the model crew. Another positive that I want to note is the use of sound. There's a real exploration of sound effects this year, adding to the atmosphere of scenes, some that I didn't actually notice before until this latest rewatch. Like in this scene of Thomas filling up on water. Later, when James stopped for water, Thomas was already in front of him. You hear some metal sounds and a subtle water filling sound effect. It's nothing impressive, but it's neat. I don't think they've ever really done that before. In Halloween, there's all these wonderful and chilling sounds of metal and chains that give the area a creepy, ominous feel. And the best use of sound this season, in my opinion, is the sequence of Edward pushing Gordon and the Express up the hill in You Can Do It, Toby. I love the lack of narration and the focus on the chuffing sounds and steam gushing and the metal grinding. It really makes you feel like you're there. The trains feel giant and heavy and real. Completely unrelated footnote, but I'm mentioning it here because I'm talking about sound effects. Has anyone ever noticed the weird-ass jet plane sound effect they gave Spencer here? Up ahead, Spencer had to stop. Why does he sound like a jet engine whirring down? What do they mean by this? A common theme of the season is the engine's fear about being scrapped. It comes up weirdly often, and I never noticed how prominent it was before. We have an episode about Gordon worrying he's starting to fall apart. What if Diesel's right, he thought. What if Sir Topham Hatt scraps me? And what will become of him? We have Percy mishearing Topham, thinking he's going to be sent to the scrapyard. Percy has been late too often this week, said Sir Topham Hatt. He must go to the scrapyards tomorrow. Sir Topham Hatt wants to scrap me, gasped Percy. And we have this really chilling vision Thomas has after Diesel tells him his time is limited. What if Sir Topham Hatt scraps all of us? Pretty frightful stuff. The season's Halloween episode even takes the characters to the scrapyard, where its rumored scrap engine's ghosts lurk about. 
It's pretty interesting seeing how these characters all deal with the same fear in their own ways. Gordon just keeps pressing on till the end, Percy runs away and hides, and Thomas proves his worth. In an era where the episodes are becoming more dumbed down and revolve around more kitty things like magic carpets or snowman balloons or circuses, these plots that deal with a more grounded fear, like being scrapped, stand out in a good way. A lot of the negatives that we started seeing in season 6 or so are very present here, and I think that's largely due to the new writer's bible being based on that season. The bible references season 6 quite a few times, which makes sense, since that would have been the newest season out at the time. Many episodes start with that filler intro to pad out time, you know the one I'm talking about, where the narrator just tells us what a beautiful day it is on Sodor, and what Job X Engine is doing. It was a glorious summer day on the island of Sodor. Toby was collecting milk from the dairy. James was pulling passengers to Brendam Docks. It was a cool summer's night on the island of Sodor. All of the engines were very busy and there were lots of jobs to do. Gordon pulled the express and Percy took the mail. Before finally jumping into the actual story. Not to mention, morals are becoming far more present and they have to be outright stated. Sometimes it's fine and sometimes it's very ham-fisted and blatant. Emily's adventure, I think, is the worst case of this, where Thomas has to literally tell Emily to ask nicely if she wants something. That's because you're a big bossy boiler. You should try asking nicely for a change. This is in stark contrast to the previous era, where morals were subtle. Story and characters were prioritized first, and were written in a way that didn't talk down to children. It's something that George Carlin himself praised the show for during his time on it. The morals of these stories were never jammed down the kid's throat. They weren't blatant. They weren't um, in capital letters. They were gently massaged into the framework of the show. Emily was pleased. She'd arrived on time. Asking nicely was all she'd had to do. Uh... <laughs> Another thing I want to note about this season is its pacing. Now I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing, but the pace of the episodes is a lot slower, with long uninterrupted takes of the engines traveling, and we're just watching the story happen slowly. Now I think this is partially due to the new longer runtime, but also partly because of the new style that they're going for. Instead of being snappy like previous seasons, it's slower, so everything happening is easy for the younger audiences to follow. You know what this reminds me of? Theodore Tugboat. Yeah, y'all remember that show? Even the score here is kinda similar, going for a more calmer vibe. This works fine in Theodore since this was like its thing, but here it's a little strange feeling, because prior Thomas was always edited at a quicker pace. The previous four and a half minute runtime meant they couldn't waste time. Now, with a 7 minute runtime, simpler stories with less substance than before are being drawn out. It's like Thomas ASMR. I'm not saying it's bad per se, just really noticeably different to what came before. I have to wonder how much more enjoyable these episodes would be if they were edited to a 4.5 minute runtime. I find many of the episode plots this year to be rather repetitive. I mentioned earlier that we have three different episodes that all see their main character dealing with the notion that they may be scrapped one day. But we also have two episodes that feature a character taking over the express for Gordon when he's away. Two episodes where Thomas takes on too much work and learns he needs to let others help him. And three episodes where Thomas rushes to do a job and screws it up because he refuses to be patient. Everything is starting to feel kinda samey and I wonder if that's a result of the writers being rushed to fill a 26 episode quota every year now, or a matter of them being so limited with the new smaller cast. As a soft reboot, season 8 feels like it is almost starting from scratch again. Almost like a new season 1 with its minimal cast and having characters learn lessons that they've learned ages ago. But at the same time, it's not totally ignoring the past events, and characters that were introduced previously are still canon. So it puts the show into this weird middle ground where the previous history exists, but the main characters have been dumbed down, reverted into younger, sometimes unrecognizable versions of themselves. 
I think the weirdest retcon of the whole season is that Henry never pulls passengers. I'd like to pull passengers, sighed Henry, just for a change. And he doesn't know how to? Like, what? Henry wished he would never have to pull passengers ever, ever again. And then, in other episodes, they show him pulling passengers. They couldn't even stick with their own retcon in the same season. I'll talk more about this in the characters section. That is to say, though, the characters aren't fully gone yet. There are bright spots throughout the season where the true versions of themselves shine through. I love Thomas and Percy defending Edward and Edward the Great. Thomas and Percy were cross. Edward was their friend. An honest steamy can beat a pouty puffer any day. Gordon being unimpressed with the magic carpet is funny. A carpet? No wonder Sir Topham Hat gave the job to a small engine. I love Percy cheering on Toby. You can do it, Toby! Go on, cried Percy. And my favorite moment of the whole season is this. Gordon said a really useful engine never needs help, moaned Thomas. Ha! <laughs> laughed Edward. I'm always helping Gordon up the hill. That is a goaded Edward moment, perfectly in character. The new score by Robert Hartshorn fully comes into play this year. If you're a US viewer like me, you got your first taste of it in Season 7. If you're in the UK and you're watching the show in order, then your first taste of it was in the Jack episodes. But now it's the main score for the rest of the show moving forward. And to its credit, it's not a bad score. There's a ton of standout moments that stick with me. I like that pitter-patter when the snow starts falling in Snowplow. I like that theme used at the beginning of Chickens to School. I really like those drums and the epic build-up when Toby is pushing Gordon up the hill. I love this whole piece in general. It's really inspirational sounding. And of course, the chilling choir score throughout all of Halloween. Robert Hartshorn is a good composer, and he later really shines on in the CGI era when his stuff got more experimental. I think the overall attitude towards the new score is a result of it being tied to these dull, drawn-out episodes. We hear this music, and it's this era that comes to mind. The era that featured stories about snowman balloons, and the main characters being written wrong, and the narrow gauge engines acting like little children. On its own, separate from the content it's connected to, it's not at all bad. Not to mention, all the individual character themes are all new. To me, it's such a strange decision that after 20 years of associating the themes by O'Donnell and Campbell so closely with these characters, to have them all thrown out and everyone is just given new ones. I can't think of any other show or movie series that has done this. Imagine if, like, Star Wars just randomly decided to ditch the Force theme and invented a new piece of music we're supposed to associate the Force with. That is basically what happened here. I understand this was an intentional change. Hit wanted something new to match the new style of the show and brought in new talent to keep things fresh. But I have to wonder why there was such a deviance. Surely Hartshorn could have done new music, but maybe redid the characters' themes in his own style just to keep things a little consistent with what came before? Let's wrap up this section by talking about the narrators. I'll start with Michael Brandon. And I gotta say, I've never been a huge Brandon fan. But in season 8, he's not bad. He's pretty good. I know the timeline of how production went in the early hit era is a little fuzzy, but this is the first season he narrated, I believe, before doing season 7. So as a result, his voice is a little more calmer and natural sounding. But when Thomas arrived at the quarry, he had a nasty surprise. Oh, it's you, Oil Diesel. What are you doing here? I'm here to help Mavis, puffed Thomas proudly. Steamies can't help, not like a diesel. 
That's not true, said Thomas crossly. Henry rolled up to the wishing tree. He took a deep breath and made a wish, as hard as he could. I wish, I wish I could pull the express instead of Gordon, he said. He hasn't started doing the really annoying, nasally voices yet, and all the characters sound pretty natural. With the exception of Gordon. Now look what you've done, he wished. What will Sir Topham Hatt say? Wait, 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 wait. He didn't sound like that earlier. Keep your smelly freight away from my passengers, grumbled Gordon. The Express is the longest passenger train on the island. I always cross the island twice by tea time. Passengers and freight do not mix, huffed Gordon. Ugh, Brandon. I found myself enjoying Brandon in the pack episodes. And I quite liked him here. Was delightfully surprised by that. And now for the UK. After hearing how energetic Michelangelo's was in the pack episodes, I really wanted to believe that his slower delivery in Season 7 was a one-time fluke. But nope, it's still very much the same here. This is a pretty boring season for him, honestly, where the enthusiasm just wasn't there. I mean, just compare his delivery here with Brandon's. Wait for me! He cried. Please, wait! Help! Cried Percy. Murdoch has got my magic carpet! Wait for me! He cried. Please, wait! Help! Percy cried. Murdoch has got my magic carpet! He has his moments, of course. Hurry up! She wished. Not if you ask like that, sniffed Elizabeth crossly. When Thomas and Emily rolled by, they moaned and groaned. It sounded spooky. What was that? And I guess you could argue his narration matches the new slower pace of these episodes, but it is a far cry from the previous energetic Angelus that we just had a couple seasons ago. So, originally, when I first made this video, I omitted the part where I count the top three players of the season, as we're getting into the era where it's obvious who will be in first place, etc. But, I figured it's better to stay consistent. So, here we go. In third place, we have James, with three leads. In second place, we have a tie between Percy and Emily, with five lead roles each. And in first place, to no one's surprise, Thomas, with a grand whopping total of 13 lead roles. God almighty. Season 8 is the first season not to feature any new characters, and I think it's the only one ever not to. Isn't that insane to think about? This was intentional though, as they were firmly establishing the Steam Team as a thing here, as well as the new minimized supporting cast so they didn't introduce any new faces to take focus away from them. Let's just cover all the main characters here. They all range from pretty good to bafflingly out of character this year, and I think we can blame the writer's bible for that with its weird character bios. In this season, I think the one that has suffered the most from the changes is Thomas. Thomas has been redefined as a young character again, as a sort of everyman for young audiences forgetting lessons that he's already learned in the past, such as being patient, and also giving him new traits, such as turning into a nervous wreck when his support system, Annie and Clarabelle, are not with him, something that was never an issue for him before. This going back on Thomas isn't totally a new thing, as they already started dipping their toes in this in Season 7. I feel this change to a younger Thomas was sort of inevitable the longer the show went on, you're far more limited with a main character who has completed his character arc years ago than one who is still impressionable and has much to learn. And as Thomas is supposed to be the everyman for the young audience, I don't think they really have much choice. I think the reason this is so bothersome to me is that they aren't consistent with it. In episodes where Thomas isn't the main character, he's depicted as a voice of reason and everyone comes to him for answers and support. Not to mention, the colossal amount of screen time he gets in these hit seasons. Half of this season is all Thomas Spotlight episodes, literally. 13 of the 26 are Thomas episodes. I totally get that he's the main character, but a little more variety would have been nice. Nonetheless though, he has a couple good episodes in this lot. 
I really like Thomas to the Rescue, an episode where he proves himself despite his fear of being replaced. I also quite like Thomas and the firework display. His banter with James feels very true to him. Hello, busted boiler, teases Thomas. You don't look very useful now. I also like how they kept some of his character quirks consistent with previous seasons, such as hating wearing his snowplow and hating pulling fish trains, both of which, funnily enough, are quirks that are mentioned directly in the writer's bible. Edward and Toby didn't fare much better. Both are really starting to settle into their vulnerable, pathetic loser eras, where the others, or they themselves, think they're incapable of doing anything substantial because they're different in some way, at least in their spotlight episodes. But Edward is old, and not as strong as the other engines. He'll lose the race and let the whole railway down, said James. Edward is old, get it? That's his character now. Old, slow geezer. But I'll never be able to do Edward's job, Toby cried. He's a proper steam engine. Toby is a box, get it? He's weird and looks different. That's his character now. No self-confidence. They both come through at the end of each of their lead roles, proving the others wrong. And these two having these personal weaknesses is fine every now and then. But I really don't like these being their default when they get the spotlight, when both have so much more going on than that, and have already proved themselves as capable to the others time and time again before this. Percy was also on shaky ground this year. He really seems to have been recreated as the baby of the group, learning really, really silly things that should not be new to him. He learns to not whistle loudly. He didn't know this before. He's never heard of a railway inspector somehow. The railway inspector arrives today. What's a railway in spectacles? Percy asked. And he's also forgotten how to pull coaches, even though he's seen with coaches this year and the previous. Hmm. What is it with the green engines and coaches this year? He's still got some of the old Percy in him. I love how he gets fed up with Gordon and Gordon takes charge, only to show him up. I like that he entertains the idea that the carpet could be magic, and I like him getting angry at James for being late, and then later teasing him when he gets his comeuppance. I like your new coat of paint, he puffed cheekily. You do look splendid. And then we have Henry. Oh boy. On one hand, I love that they remembered his love for the forest, and it is so nice to see that side of his character being pushed more to help differentiate him from the others. On the other hand, his more arrogant, big-engine self is totally forgotten, as is almost everything else that made Henry Henry. Now he's a more inept engine that solely pulls freight, that never ever pulls passengers, and can't handle coaches. Go gently, called his driver. You can bump freight, but you can't bump passengers. Sorry, puffed Henry. With the show trying to push Emily more now, it seems like she's sort of replaced him as the third snooty engine in the big three. Gordon, on a lighter note, I think was handled pretty well. In some episodes, he is such a jerk and so belittling, like in You Can Do It Toby and Chickens to School. And then in others, like Squeak, Rattle, and Roll, he feels like the Gordon we know. Percy and the Magic Carpet is a good Gordon appearance in my opinion. He's so unimpressed with Percy's delivery. Still trying to make your little job look important, he grumbled. But when shit hits the fan, he jumps in to help save it. I like how in Edward the Great, he is such a jerk to Edward, which admittedly feels out of character, but later he feels bad about it, and he cheers Edward on. Well done, Edward, he called. You are a credit to the railway. These are nice moments, really showing the big brother side of his character. I'm okay with this. I don't mind seeing snooty jerk-ass Gordon, as long as it's not the only side we get to see of him. And that goes for all the characters. Season 8 did a pretty decent job of striking a good middle ground with him. And then we have James, who is, as far as I can tell, pretty much the same he's always been. He's a character that's pretty hard to mess up, I think. I don't have much to say about him. I think all his appearances were pretty solid this year. James Goes Too Far is a pretty decent episode for him, which, in my opinion, feels almost out of Season 1. James tries to prove his worth to top him, and becomes worried when he comes to see him after the incident he caused only to receive praise for fixing the mistake on his own. I'm sorry, sir, said James. I put my own job first. But you did learn your lesson and you helped Diesel. 
and you delivered your call on time. You, James, are a really useful engine. James nearly burst with pride. Nice. I also like the rivalry between him and Thomas in the fireworks episode. The hit era played with these two a lot together. I'm all for it. But I think that the season's MVP award rightfully goes to... Emily. Of all the characters, she is the one that really blossomed this year, making her gradual transition to main character status. Since they're trying to build her up, they gave her some stories that dug into her character. Episodes like Snowplow and Emily's Adventure show that she can be rather bossy. And... I'm gonna be honest and I don't know if this will be a controversial opinion or not. I kinda dig this version of Emily. I said before in the Season 7 video that Emily was kind of generic, so having her with more of a Lucy-inspired persona gives her more of an identity. It doesn't feel totally out of nowhere either. She was shown to have a moment in Season 7 where she calls the others out. My favorite Emily episode of the year is Emily's New Root, a story that plays on her still being kinda newish to Sodor and never having been to Blacklock. It also shows some of her fears and makes us feel bad for her. A nice contrast to the bossy Emily in the other episodes, showing she's not totally unlikable. Don't get me wrong, Emily is not devoid of bad episodes this season. Emily's adventure in particular is pretty bad. But I think they overall did a good job of making Emily a unique character of her own. I feel like I really know her now thanks to this season. And that's why I believe she deserves the MVP award. The standout episode of Season 8 is, and I think many of you will agree with me here, Halloween. Oh come on, you all knew this one was coming, as if it could have been anything else. In a season where all the stories feel kinda samey, the one that is drastically different in tone and visual style is of course going to be the standout. This is a genuinely chilling episode, with a score that sends shivers down my spine. Sticking true to the Thomas style, I love that this episode is ambiguous with the supernatural. The characters learn over the course of the episode that ghosts aren't real, only for the final shot of the episode to show us otherwise. What is real, and what isn't? Funnily enough, the US version of this episode uses a different ending shot, removing the ghost from it. Does anyone know why this was done? Did they really think having a ghost appear in the final shot was too scary for American kids? Oh, brother. As for the worst episode, well, we have a couple contenders. But my vote's going to Chickens to School. This episode is just dumb, and it makes no sense. In this one, Thomas has to make three deliveries, but he's so tired from working all night that he mixes them up. He delivers children to a farm, pigs to a market, and chickens to school. But he gets blamed for it? How, how is any of this Thomas's fault? Humans unloaded the goddamn chicken cages for whatever reason. Isn't it their fault? Thomas did exactly what a steam engine is supposed to do. Transport the train to its destination. Humans having a presence on Sodor is just totally foregoed here. They're just starting to become the engine's hands. Ironically though, this episode has my favorite moment of the entire season. Yes, it's the scene where Edward calls Gordon out. <laughs> I also find Thomas and the Circus and Emily's Adventure to be particularly bad episodes, both for the same reason. They are repetitive and boring with blatant morals. We know exactly what the lesson is going to be two minutes in. The load is too heavy and Thomas needs to let others help him, and Emily needs to ask nicely to get what she wants. There are bright spots to both. I like the circus train and the circus performer props. They're very creative and colorful. And I like the storm sequence in Emily's adventure. Sadly, I say both were wasted in what are very dull stories where nothing really happens. As for the sum up, I'm going to go with fish. I feel like if I were to give anyone who's never seen Thomas an idea of what to expect from the hit era, this one would hit everything to make note of. It's a Thomas-focused story where he does a job wrong, featuring gimmicky fish trucks where the fish are transported in open wagons, so it's visually clear to kids what they're carrying. Again, foregoing railway realism. A scene where the main character learns their lesson and the moral is stated, all complete 
with a pretty cool crash. I feel like this is season 8 in a nutshell, am I wrong? But my personal favorite episode of season 8 goes to Squeak, Rattle, and Roll. I really adore this one. It's a peak Gordon appearance in my opinion that gets his character down perfectly. In this one, Diesel floats the idea that steam engines haven't much time left on Sodor, once Sir Topham Hat realizes how clapped out they are. Gordon scoffs at this at first, until he notices himself start squeaking. Diesel was right! I'm falling apart! What will Sir Topham Hat say? The more he squeaks, the more Diesel's words start to get to him. What if he really is falling apart? This worsens when he begins to make more strange noises that he can't explain, and the only way to suppress them is to go slowly. On the day he is meant to take a special to the docks with Topham on board, Gordon tries to suppress his noises, but realizes that he can't with Topham on board. In a grand moment of self-realization, Gordon proclaims this. This might be my last trip, he said, but I'll get the children to their boat on time. If today is going to be his last ever journey, then he's going to make it the best that he's ever had, and makes record time. In the end, of course, Topham says that he would never scrap Gordon, and sends him to have his noises looked at. We all know that Topham would never scrap Gordon, and that Gordon's fear was totally irrational, but it's the moment where he decided that he would go out with a bang that really did it for me. He's a very admirable character here, chalking him up to the legends of Edward, Scarloe, and Reneus when they all had similar moments in the past. A fantastic outing for Season 8. The word that I would use to describe Season 8 of Thomas and Friends is... Milk Toast. As a friend of mine put it, it is not completely bad on its own. But Season 8 is the unfamiliar taste of New Coke after knowing OG Coke all your life. And I think that sums up my feelings quite well. Seasons 1 through 5, and even 6 to 7, were all about discovering Sodor like an adventure, with each season opening up new parts of the world and introducing new characters to fill those new areas. The show consistently built up its world, and watching the show develop over time was like a journey. Season 8 sort of feels like an abrupt halt from that, and is more focused on feelings and morals and solely re-establishing the characters in this new vision. With Season 8, Thomas and Friends has become rather neutered, and I don't think this season has any chance of making the top 10 when I eventually rank all the seasons. Even so, I do get why people say Season 8 is the good one of the hit era. There are some good ideas in this, good character moments, good model work, and we haven't reached the abysmal three strikes formula yet, but I still don't think it holds a candle to the season's past. I have my issues with Season 6, but at least it was always exciting, and it still felt like Thomas. Season 8 is very drawn out, and frankly, kinda boring. There's little moments that I enjoy, it's not totally devoid of interesting stories, but the majority of this run of episodes are slow and dull, with a very restrained cast of characters, and it doesn't exactly paint the future of Thomas and Friends, under Hit's ownership, with bright colors. I think our next look at Season 9 and onwards will be interesting. They're all a part of that middle era of the show that I hardly ever rewatch, and I'm curious in seeing what ways the next outing will improve upon Season 8, or be worse. And thus ends another installment of the Thomas Retrospective. We are 9 in now, folks. 10 if we include the Magic Railroad review. Next, chronologically, is Calling All Engines, and I'm not totally sure if I should cover that in its own video, or just skip the specials altogether and just go straight into Season 9. I've also thought about maybe combining the specials with their respective seasons, so the Season 9 retrospective would also talk about aspects of Calling All Engines, Season 11 and The Great Discovery, Season 13 and Hero of the Rails, etc, etc. I'm not totally sure yet. You tell me below what you think I should do. A couple things I want to quickly shout out here. First off, the Unlucky Tug theme song is back. You haven't heard it yet, but you will hear it when the end screen shows. I just want to thank Isaiah, aka One Tram Band, for his work here. 
He made an excellent lo-fi remix of it for me, and I just could not be happier with it. Go subscribe to his channel and his SoundCloud, support this man. Links to his socials are in the description. Lastly, I want to shout out my second channel, The Lucky Tug, once again. This is my catch-all channel for content that I put together that I don't want to clog my main with. I have been working on the side on a brand new multi-video tugs project. Been in the works for maybe six weeks now? Two months maybe? It's nearing completion, and I will upload them all there when finished. I'll probably make an announcement here once they're ready to go up, so you'll all know. I'm hoping for the first week of December, but that may get pushed back depending on how quickly I can work on this alongside my main channel stuff. It's a totally new project, and I'm not going to reveal what it is just yet, but to all my Tugs fans out there, I think you're going to really enjoy this. At the very, very least, get a kick out of it. I'm really happy with how it's turning out so far. That is all from me, folks. Have a wonderful day, and I will see you all in the next one.